is still in session. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 17253 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton on trauma recovery and support for first responders. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. And with those members who wish to speak in the debate, press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Alec Cole Hamilton to open the debate. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to lead this members' debate. And with it, the opportunity to pay tribute to Scotland's first responders, both professional and voluntary, those trained and those thrown into the worst imaginable situations simply because they are there. They are unassuming heroes who act sometimes without forethought and come to the aid of others. And they deserve the thanks of every member in this chamber and this entire country. Presiding officer, on any given day in Scotland, people die in the arms of strangers, but we seldom stop to think about the strangers after the fact. Those inflection points of crisis can have an impact on the psychology of an individual similar to combat stress, yet we often expect those individuals, be they professional or bystander, to carry on with very little in terms of support or access to services. For our professional first responders, that stress is reaching crisis point. Research by Unison published recently found that 25% of ambulance staff rate their job as 10 on a 1 to 10 stress scale, with many thinking of leaving the service. Almost all, 98% of paramedics, have experienced violence and abuse while working, and almost three quarters of respondents describe morale as poor. Right, aside from the regular stresses of working antisocial hours, these workers regularly attend events of acute trauma where they may encounter multiple fatalities, sometimes involving children. In my first months as a member of this parliament, I met an emergency worker who had attended the casualties of the Lockerbie bombing. He told me of the nightmares he suffers to this day and the fact that at no point was he offered any kind of support. I know of one 40-year-old paramedic in my constituency who was recently medically retired with post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's a cumulative effect as well. Andy Cunningham is my constituent. He works at the National uh, Risk and Resilience Centre as an ambulance worker. He came to see me recently about the mental pressure he and his colleagues are under. He described, he summed that up in a, dis a story that he described to me about how he recently retrieved the body of a young woman at Leith Docks, which made him realize he needed help. I asked if I could use his words to describe that to the chamber, and he agreed. He says, I felt nothing, noth no feeling at all at the time, other than that I nearly lost her trying to hook the body in. That night I reflected on why I'd become so numb to death. I had seen hundreds of dead people, by that time, I'd lost my father, two close friends, and a cousin to, uh, to suicide. So I knew that what I was feeling wasn't right. I felt so numb, so alone, and it didn't feel good. I knew it wasn't normal for one human to feel nothing for another. And that's when I knew I needed to speak to somebody. I was lucky in that I, had, I took some time off. I found a counselor that listened and helped with my perspective, that in time I was able to return to work. I see that young girl's body every day and I will do so for the rest of my life. Others aren't so lucky. They're so traumatized by what they see. They are broken. They're broken for, all, for life, but the lucky ones survive. Remember that one in four ambulance responders have considered ending their own lives. Dark thoughts to make the pain and trauma disappear. This can't continue and we need to care for the carers. I want to thank Andy for having the courage to share his story with me and giving it permission to share it with you. His words speak to a trauma experienced by those in our professional emergency service. We blithely expect them to be there when we most need them, but rarely consider the impact of what they bear witness to and the emotional baggage that they carry. Presiding officer, in a public policy context, we are beginning to understand so much more about trauma so getting assistance to our emergency workers should be routine, but it is not. Nor is it readily provided to members of the public caught up in these events. Almost universally, the immediate first responder at the scene of any trauma will be a bystander, often unknown to the victims of that trauma, and often untrained in any form of first aid, but most will try to intervene. In March 2015, I was walking through the city center when a man very sadly took his life from a tall building and died on the pavement beside me. I was the first responder at that scene and I remember the trauma of that moment. I see it to this day. I still have nightmares about it and I am, uh, have a triggering response whenever I hear 
workmen in scaffolding overhead because it reminds me of his screaming before he jumped. Um, I was joined at the scene by Janice Malone, who I was recently reacquainted with. Janice uh, w was there uh, equally distant from the, the man when he fell, and the, the scene was like something from a war zone. I was very lucky. I got some counselling immediately after in terms of trauma recovery. Um, and, but it was Janice has had a much harder road back, and she was di diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. To her credit, she's taken her experience and the depression she had to battle through to come back from it uh, to foster a new desire to help people like myself and Janice who witness terrible things. And she and I will be working with organizations like Sam H and the Samaritans to start to build a, a package of support around those people who are caught up in terrible events. I want to thank her for, uh, for her courage and the work that we are going to do together. There are many thousands of individuals like myself and like Janice, like Andy Cunningham, who carry the trauma of what they've seen with them. Yet in public policy terms, we don't often stop to think about the ripple, event, uh, the ripple effect that these events and these incidents can have. That is why I am calling for the creation of a national first responder trauma recovery strategy that will help begin the process of healing the tens of thousands of our fellow Scots, both professional and civilian who have seen terrible things and been caught up in catastrophic events. As I said at the start of my remarks, Deputy Presiding Officer, people die in the arms of strangers every day. We need to start thinking about what happens to those strangers afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole Hamilton. I now call Gillian Martin to be followed by Brian Whittle. Ms. Martin, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to thank Kelly Cole Hamilton for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Um, and, and for his very moving speech. My, my focus on this is adverse childhood experiences and I guess the role of those working with children. And I want to thank Bernardos for their briefing ahead of this debate. Yesterday I was, um, I was having a meeting with Tom Fox from the Scottish Prison Service about the Family Visitor Centre at HMP Grampian in Peterhead. And during a wide ranging uh, conversation with Tom uh, around victims of crime, he was relating to me that so many young offenders in Pullman have experienced multiple bereavements bereavements that, that, that we maybe can't even comprehend. And he believes that those traumatic experiences and the psychological harm that is a result of that trauma left untreated is in large part the root cause of their offending behaviour. And that many of, of, of these people are actually victims of, of, of crime themselves as well, but certainly victims of, of uh, childhood trauma. Many of those children are also care experienced. A lot of them go into foster care after losing a parent. And Bernardo's make mention of the service they offer at Pullman, the Here and Now service they run to support young men and women. And they say in their briefing, too often we hear from young people that they just wanted someone to listen to them, someone to talk to, someone to be with them and alongside them through their experiences. And I found that absolutely heartbreaking. Not many of us can Im imagine what it would be like as a child to witness a, a parent's death. But for many children, that is the trauma that they are living with. A neighbour of mine, um, who no longer lives in my street, but we were reasonably close, was a foster carer for some years back. And she became a foster mum to a young man who had previously been adopted after he was witness to his mother's murder by his own father when he was around five years old. And a decade on, his relationship broke down with his adopted parents as he found himself reliving the trauma again as he's approaching adulthood. Um, he was an incredibly bright ma a young man, a compassionate chap, and a lad that should have been looking forward to his future at college and beyond. Um, but that, that future and that, that experience in college was very rocky for him and he, he kept on dropping out because he was a very damaged young man who, as he approached 16, it's clear that he could not enter adulthood unsupported. Many um, children like him would, would uh, now not be in the position of facing a cliff edge of foster care ending at 16. Um, but more than that, he's exactly the kind of child who, without mental health interventions, could face a very uncertain future. And I've been thinking a lot about him this week as I've been preparing for this debate. I wonder where he is now as an adult, and I wonder if any... What, what, if any, specialist help he got throughout his childhood. But I also wonder what specialist help or training his adoptive parents or my foster carer neighbour had um, to help them help him. 
The work been done by the Scottish Government and partners like Bernardo's on developing the Scottish Psychological Trauma and Adversity Training Plan is going to be crucial in giving everyone who comes into contact with trauma-experienced children the support they need to, to work with them um, and react to any kind of, uh, I suppose, result of that trauma that they see presented to them. The kind of trauma that I have uh, just described with my, with my neighbour's foster son is always going to leave a mark, of course it is. But with trauma-informed training and, I guess, extra interventions like school counsellors in place to relieve the pressure on adolescent mental health services, we can, I hope, assist these children to cope with that trauma and lead a life that does not result in further tragedy. Thank you very much. I call Brian Whittle, be followed by David Stewart. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I add my thanks to Alex Cole Hamilton for bringing uh, this debate uh, to the Chamber? I think one of the things we are talking about today is the fact that trauma isn't always uh, physical. I was uh, attended and spoke at the Police uh, Scotland Wellbeing Conference earlier on this week, which was quite timely because I knew this this uh, debate was coming to the, the chamber. And one of the things they discussed there was this idea of the vicarious trauma, uh, which they were saying is, is, is that, that sort of process of change uh, from empathetic engagement with trauma survivors. Anyone who engages empathetically with survivors of traumatic incidents, torture, and material relating to their tra trauma is potentially uh, affected. And it stays with us, as, as Gillian Martin highlighted there in her presentation, uh, discussing ACEs and how that single traumatic event in an early life can come on to affect the rest of an individual's life. And, it, and um, I spoke yesterday uh, again uh, uh, about uh, the problem of drug and alcohol consumption and uh, um, is, is linked into the way that uh, uh, we protect our children and, and, and it links into this as well. As Gillian Martin said there, that, that more likely to have uh, issues of problem drug and al alcohol consumption, more likely to have poor outcomes if these are not addressed. Our first responders are those people who choose uh, to put themselves in harm's way uh, to help others. And there have been several major incidents in recent years that I've seen the emergency services deal with hugely difficult situations. We had the Scott Stockline plastics explosion. We had the Glasgow uh, bin lorry crash, which, which actually it feels to me that all of us were somehow involved in that because, because we saw the pictures of that and even some video of that. We had the Clutha helicopter uh, crash, which I think is even more difficult for the emergency services to deal with because the, their colleagues were among the victims. But it's not just major incidents that can be traumatic. First responders can encounter the aftermath of violent crimes. They can themselves uh, be assaulted or attacked. I think at the, at the, at the, the, the Wellbeing Co Champions Conference in Police Scotland, some, there was some great work being done inside Police Scotland uh, through their well-being team and their well-being champions, uh, recognising that need uh, to give a, even a, just somebody to talk to and somebody that, that, that will listen. Child Bereavement UK were also uh, a, a attended that conference, which I think is, is, is hugely important because, again, we forget that our uh, first-line responders uh, have to attend and, and break news uh, to, to, uh, in that terrible way. And we're looking at the, the way that um, uh, the Police Scotland use of trauma risk management. And some of the things that came out of that conference, uh, and some of the, the, the behaviours, the, the, the warning signs that they suggested were things like finding it unusually difficult to support clients as you normally would. More mistakes, making more mistakes than usual. Reduction in your normal self-care activities. I think Alex Cole Hamilton uh, 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 highlighted this very well in his speech, this idea uh, of... of so that signs of compassion fatigue and, and burnout. And there's physical signs like exhaustion and insomnia, headaches, frequent minor, minor, minor in, uh, illnesses and, and somatization, that, that physical manifestation of psychological concerns. The, the, the behavioral signs, the use of alcohol and drugs, sickness absences, anger levels, avoidance of clients, decision-making, personal relationships breaking down, that reduced compassion care for clients and, and, and depleted parenting and even changed changing eating habits so trauma and it's trauma the signs of trauma uh, uh, we should all be aware of and should all be able to recognize 
And perhaps, perhaps uh, uh, um, in a conclusion, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's that idea I think we, sh we need to, in, in when looking at mental health, look beyond the NHS, look into our third sector, and look into all, uh, uh, to ourselves and how we could support those who have potentially uh, 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 experienced trauma themselves. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Thank you very much. I call David Stewart. We follow by Alison Johnson. Mr. Stewart, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I start by congratulating Alec Cole Hamilton and success in bringing this important debate to Chamber today, and if I say so, for his very moving and insightful speech. And apologies, President Officer, that uh, I may need to leave at 1.30. I've got a meeting with some health professionals if the debate does go that on, and I would like just to apologise to the Chamber for that. And my quote that often gets repeated in the wake of public tragedy is look for the helpers. And it was the late American children's TV host, Mr. Rogers, who said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words and I'm always comforted by realizing there's still so many helpers, so many caring people in the world. Immediately after seeing the scenes that all too often are in the news, like the Grenfell Tower disaster, the terror attack at Tower Bridge, like the Manchester Arena terror attack, we need to find comfort in seeing the good in other people. Seeing strangers risk their lives to help those in need is an important part of that. And these days, with the rise of social media, these people are sometimes able to be applauded and cheered across the globe. And they are, of course, should be celebrated. Selfless acts of bravery and kindness are often all we can do to cling at times of tragedy. But what happens after? Witnessing trauma, whether a one-off terror attack or watching a loved one die, or whether sustained like domestic abuse or active service in the armed forces can have a long-term lasting negative effect on mental health. These effects might show immediately and they might not become apparent for some time. And all too often, they go hand in hand with other health concerns like drug and alcohol misuse, broader mental health conditions and poor well-being. Unresolved trauma and stress can cause psychological harm for many years, regardless of whether it's triggered by a single incident or a complex trauma. Now, first responders vary from those who work in the front lines, particularly those in the emergency services and those in the third sector, as well as members of the public who step up when they see people in need. And with, 18, with waiting times in the NHS mental health being alarmingly high, many needing psychological help are left wanting. Not only are we unable to thank the helpers by helping them in return, but the NHS is struggling to even help the mental health of its own staff. These people have gone above and beyond the call of duty. And then when they need our help, they have to wait months, sometimes years. Uh, presiding officer. Uh, Minister. Uh, just for clarification, obviously the NHS has a duty of care to its staff and it does have access to in-house counselling services that staff can access via occupational health and they can do that on a confidential basis. David Stewart. Yes, can I thank the Minister for intervention? Obviously I'm aware of that and as the Minister knows in the joint visit that we did uh, recently to New Craigs and Vaness, uh, staff themselves on the front line can also experience uh, trauma and emotional difficulty but I do understand the point that the Minister uh, is making. Uh, Presiding um, Officer, I support uh, the motion and Alec O'Hamilton's call for the Scottish Government to bring forward a national first responder trauma recovery strategy. It's time for us not only to look for the helpers but to help them too. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Alison Johnson, followed by Tom Mason. Mr. Mason is the last speaker in the open debate. Ms. Johnson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank Alex Cole Hamilton for giving us the opportunity to debate this important matter. Um, his motion calls on the Scottish Government to bring forward a national first responder trauma recovery strategy. And I'm pleased to support this call. I know that we're all hugely appreciative of our first responders. We're beyond grateful to all who intervene to save lives. Um, in some cases, they're, they're, they're not professional um, and they, they step in until trained first responders arrive at that scene. Now, one of my brothers has been a firefighter for 22 years and I asked him about his experience of accessing such support, um, if there were any barriers and, and what they might be. Now, he has good support at home. His wife is a neonatal nurse, and she's ideally placed to understand that desire to protect and to preserve life, because that's what they've chosen to do as a living. She knows him well enough to understand 
what kind of day he might have had without the need to go into detail, a detail that he might not be ready to share at the end of a shift, and detail that might take some time to come to terms with. And when I ask him how he's getting on, he'll tell me about station banter, about communal cooking on shift, how busy it's been, but he doesn't really go into detail. But as you can imagine, in a career, an ongoing career of more than two decades to date, he has seen what he describes as horror stories. I know that he was sent to the uh, Clutha helicopter crash that, that Brian Whittle mentioned. Now, most of us will never come across a badly burned body. We will never see a body hemmed in and slumped over a steering wheel, never to move again. We may have seen loved ones as they have passed away. This is never easy, whether unexpected or not, but it is exceptionally demanding when your everyday work is focused on helping people in the most challenging of circumstances. Now, my brother, it seems to me, appears to take much of this in his stride, and that's testament too to the training provided by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. But clearly there are occasions when he and his colleagues are faced with demanding, uncertain events and, and outcomes that devastate people families and communities. Now, his experience within the fire service is that if there's a fatality, if there's a critical incident, a questionnaire is received at your home address and it's sent there to give you, so that you've got the space and time to, to complete it if you feel you wish to. It's voluntary. Now in 22 years of service, um, he's filled in this four page questionnaire on many occasions. He says it's very well designed to elicit the information required. And in 22 years, he has requested to use the counselling service once as he's been experiencing flashbacks following a critical incident. Now, it's clear the counsellor he saw was hugely helpful to him in processing the particular experience that had sent him there. He is clear, though, that it's vitally important that counsellors have the appropriate skills as he feels there's the potential to hinder rather than help. And he is hugely grateful to the excellent staff at the River Centre in Edinburgh. And he understands that at times what might be seen to be, you know, or even called bottling it up can in fact be a perfectly understandable coping me mechanism. But that at other times professional assistance to share that information, to process it in the most helpful manner is essential. He told me when he went to the River Centre, he was expecting to meet people in white coats, but it was the polar opposite. He said you could take your partner, your wife, your friend to the appointment. Now, clearly, he is speaking as a member of the fire service. He cannot speak for all first responders and for our other essential emergency services, but he firmly believes that such services must be available to all first responders in all emergency services and without. Individuals who intervene in traumatic uh, situations, you know, social workers may experience situations we can't comprehend. They need this help to be there. Presiding officer, he is content for me to share his experience today in order to help ensure that no one hesitates to ask for help when they do require it, as it's important that first responders and our emergency services don't feel that we all expect them to be superhuman dealing with extreme situations on a daily basis, but unable to admit that they need to take care of themselves, not just us. We need to ensure that that help is there as a matter of urgency when it's needed. That's the least we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Tom Mason. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And can I thank Alex Cole Hamilton for securing this debate today, but also for his sharing his deeply personal experiences with us. We quite rightly pay significant attention to the injuries and deaths on our streets, be they accident, accidental or not. However, I think it is fair to say that we often do not provide adequate support for those who are first to the scene, usually members of the public making a dreadful discovery, or emergency service staff who do, do incredible jobs, jobs in the most trying of circumstances. There is no doubt that in previous generations, mental health was not given the care and attention it was due. As a result, society could probably be somewhat dismissive of the psychological trauma that results from situations that members have described. For example, last year saw the opening of the new ma major trauma centre in Aberdeen. This was a welcome step forward for treating serious injury, but I cannot help but wonder what the staff there have to, have to witness and how that has affected their own lives. For those our professionals, for members of the public without training in responding to major incidents, I can only imagine that the effect is compounded many times over. 
Presiding officer, I don't wish to be overly political in this debate, but there are performance gaps which need urgent redress. Statistics released this week show that for much of March this year, there was more than 28,000 patients waiting for psychological therapy, and 30% of those had been waiting for more than 18 weeks. At the same time, against the 90% target for treatment within 18 weeks, the current rolling natural average is 77%. While these figures go beyond those first responders affected by trauma, if we want to do right by those people, then service levels must improve. Now, as far as creation of the national first responder trauma strategy goes, I'm supportive of such an idea. I know the Scottish Government has a significant number of existing mental health strategies. However, if these four focuses minds on de delivering the, the right service for those whom we need to do better, then it should be considered. Whatever route we go down to address the issue, I think we must look at the support networks around, people that go through such experiences. I'm sure we all agree that there is much easier to progress a, to progress a, sorry, to pro progress a traumatic event if someone has a family and friends that they can speak to openly with and who can be leaned on in the dark days. Presiding officer, whether or not it's someone's job to respond to the major traumatic incidents, the idea that people can take something that's that serious in their stride and a soldier on as if nothing had happened is simply not the case. We cannot predict when any individual might find themselves in such a situation, but if it happens, the right support must be there for them. We, we might not think of them at the same time as the victims or their families, but their need for care can be, it can be every bit as acute. So I hope that our debate will have the effect that, that the needs of the first responders are fully considered and that if changes need to be made, then we will commit to working constructively to making them a, 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 that aim a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I call on Claire Hockey to close for the Government Minister, please. Thank you, President Officer. And I'm pleased to respond on behalf of the Government this afternoon. And I thank Alec Cole Hamilton for securing this important debate and to Janice Malone for bravely sharing her story. Janice is one of my Rutherglen constituents and I had the pleasure of meeting her last week. The world we live in is unpredictable. In the past week, a tourist boat capsized on the Danube and searches continue for mountaineers in the Himalayas. Just beside Edinburgh Castle, there was a horrific fatal stabbing of a young man, Paul Smith, in broad daylight. His family and friends will be struggling to cope with this tragic loss and the ripple effect will be felt by witnesses and emergency services who responded. Psychological trauma is not just prompted by accidents, disasters or sudden acts of violence. Complex interpersonal trauma is caused in relationships and this can have a terrible legacy. From coercive relationships and domestic violence to the cruel horrific realities of child abuse, neglect and exploitation. And these traumatic experiences have a devastating impact on people. The ripple effect is felt by those caught up in the aftermath, our emergency services, social workers, teachers and others throughout the workforce or as jurors in criminal trials. Across Scotland, thousands of people offer assistance to strangers in moments of crisis. And we know exposure to traumatic events can have damaging effects on people's lives. The good news is that people are resilient. Just like in physical trauma, the body has an inbuilt self-repair mechanism that can apply equally to mental health trauma. Most people recover through time. And with a supportive and safe environment of family, friends and support networkers, networks. Traumatic events occur in everyone's lives. And these can be of variable severity and the effects on individuals are dependent on their meaning to them. People's reactions are, of, are particular to them, so services need to be trauma-informed. Staff must be comfortable to ask about trauma and understand what sorts of help are needed. Some individuals will go on to develop post-traumatic symptoms, and those require treatment. After a major incident, this is about a third of people within three months. And primary care can help using mental health resources in their teams and communities. After a major incident, about one in 10 people will have more complex problems requiring specialist assessment and treatment. And I know Alec Cole Hamilton's call to bring forward a strategy to ensure people caught up with 
and incident get the support that we, they need. And we have a raft of work underway to support recovery from psychological trauma, recognising the impact on first responders and members of the public. And I'm going to describe uh, some of this now. Since I became Minister for Mental Health a year ago, we've been working tirelessly to transform our mental health service into a responsive, transparent and effective service that meets the needs of all who need it. Our NHS workforce is at a record high and psychological services staff is up 69% since 2007. Presenting officer, we have some remarkable services in Scotland specialising in support to people who have experienced trauma. I recently visited the Glasgow Psychological Trauma Centre, the Anchor, and the Rivers Centre, as mentioned by Alison Johnson in her speech. Um, uh, the Rivers Centre is located in NHS Lothian, and they are centres of excellence for psychological trauma. The Anchor Centre was at the forefront of responding to emergencies such as the horrific Glasgow bin lorry and Clitheboe accidents. And experts from the River Centre helped to respond to psychological impact of the Manchester Arena bombing and the Tunisia attacks. Both services work with abuse survivors, refugees, asylum seekers and others exposed to trauma. And they have international expertise and they share knowledge generously to inform national guidance and programmes. Scotland has a multi-agency preparing Scotland guidance on community resilience to emergencies, including psychosocial and mental health needs. Large-scale incidents of mass violence, such as Manchester and the Tunisia attacks, demonstrate all nations must be prepared to cope with the aftermath of tragedies of all scales. And with this in mind, the Scottish Government has uh, currently been working closely with Rivers and Anchor Centre to examine the psychosocial response to mass casualty incidents. The Scottish Government has placed prevention of and recovery from psychological trauma at the heart of our programme for government. Scotland has been the first country to develop a robust knowledge and skills framework for psychological trauma and we've invested £1.35 million in a national three-year trauma training programme led by any NHS Education for Scotland aiming at least, uh, at least 5,000 frontline workers including teachers, prison officers, social workers and the third sector and within its first year almost 3,000 people have received training. Regional delivery pilots commence later this month in Glasgow, Lothian and Argyll and Butte to deliver local priority training. And as of May 2019, the National Trauma Training Programme now has service level agreements in every health board to coordinate training support and supervision to staff. Last month, the Deputy First Minister chaired the first national steering group to identify first uh, future priorities and a trauma training plan will be published soon. In order to support the public, we must support staff, most of whom have their own trauma history. Our police, ambulance, fire service and mountain rescue workers dedicate their careers to serving the public and many are exposed to traumatic events. They are the first responders to suicides, to terrorist incidents, to acts of violence or abuse or to fatal car accidents. And our emergency services staff welfare we take very seriously with support from qualified health and wellbeing departments. A wide range of support services are available, including employment assistance programmes and occupational health support, including trauma counselling and pastoral support. And there are examples of best practice. Police Scotland is one of the first police services in the UK to implement mandatory mental health and suicide prevention tra intervention training for all officers, up to and including the rank of inspector. And another example is the Lifeline Scotland programme. Lifelines was established in 2016 by the Rivers Centre to promote resilience and well-being of voluntary, uh, volunteer emergency responders supported by the Scottish Government and LIBOR funds. Lifelines provides training and online resources for volunteers and their family and friends. People are encouraged to notice their vital warning signs, as outlined uh, very eloquently by uh, Brian Whittle in, in his speech, and uh, embed a supportive culture and know when and where to get support. The programme has been widely acclaimed and the work is underway to explore rollouts to all three blue light services. President Officer, I'd like to close by thanking our emergency services and the members of the public who have dealt with and deal with traumatic experiences in order to help others. Your courage and compassion makes a visible and huge difference to people's lives when they're at their most vulnerable. Trauma can touch the lives of anyone at any time. 
and it's our collective duty to bring about cultural and transformational change to support the people to live their lives well. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate. And I suspend this meeting of Parliament till 2pm.